Okay, first off, if anybody's wondering, I'm growing up my facial hair for a role in a play, but that's not why we're here. We are here because 2015 is over, and although I still haven't seen all of the award-nominated films, let's just say that this list of movies is the list that will not get nominated for any awards, except these ones. These are the 10 worst films of 2015. So when I made this list last year, I had seen a little under 80 films. This year, 124 of the 2015 releases. Thankfully, it picked up near the end of the year, and a lot of films got better, but before then, boy, did this year suck. I've already talked about that in one of my previous videos, but uh, let's before I get to the list proper, let's go over a few quick honorable mentions, or should I say dishonorable mentions. Hitman, Agent 47 and The Transporter Refuel. Both of these are absolutely terrible messes of action films. I would give a slight edge to Agent 47 just because I like the actor a little bit more, but talk about waste. Uh, Insurgent. Boy, am I not liking this series, and the fact that there's going to be two more of these films just blows my mind. Aloha. What the hell happened in that? The only thing that keeps that from being on the list proper is that there's one character who's actually kind of funny. Rock the Caspah. Same thing. Bill Murray. What the fuck are you doing in these horrible films? And a, a very special dishonorable mention to the most overviewed movie of the year, Minions. This, I found out, has just won the People's Choice Award for Best Family Picture. It beat out Inside Out. You fucking people. So now that I've covered just a little bit of the trash of the year, let's get on to the real crap pile, shall we? Number 10. The Perfect Guy. This is on the list for one reason and one reason only, and it's why it's so low. This should not have been in theaters. This should not have even been video on demand. This is something you watch for free on TV. The acting is TV. The framing of all the shots is TV. The dialogue is TV. Everything about this screams, I should be watched on a TV for free on one of your network stations. The climax of the film comes about after a police officer has told this lady a story about how you can shoot someone twice with beanbag rounds from a shotgun before the third round is actually a real slug or shotgun shell, because those beanbag rounds count as warning shots. Care to guess how the actual film ends? Number 9. The Gallows. Now, I will give this film one teensy little bit of credit. Because the different characters all have their own cameras, you can get to see some different camera angles in here. In fact, sometimes they'll let a scene play out, and then you'll get to see the same scene from the perspective of another character. That is kind of interesting for a found footage movie. That doesn't overcome the fact that none of these characters have any redeeming features. Its premise is based on the fact that the school is being allowed to produce this play a play where 20 or so years ago, they had this performance, and a student died on stage while performing it. No school board in their right mind would allow this production to go forward. Not only that, this is an incident in the school's history that somehow none of the characters know anything about it because there are like two or three cast members in this production who have ties to cast members of the previous production. How can you remain that ignorant of such a famous incident in your school's history? It's just stupid! Number 8. Gem of the Holograms. I almost feel this should be higher, but I can't in good conscience do it. Because, at its core, this is really just a story about a group of sisters who get discovered and get a record contract. But for some reason, they then decide to awkwardly shove in references to the 80s cartoon. Gem is glamour and glitter, fashion and fame. How do I look? Truly? 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 Outrageous. 
<clears throat> Add on to that the fact that, for whatever reason, they decided to make this a found footage movie, so there's awkwardly crammed in YouTube videos of fans praising the band. They even have celebrity cameos like Chris Pratt shows up for some strange reason to say she, he likes the band. They obviously didn't make this ap to appeal to fans of the old show because it doesn't resemble it at all. It's certainly not going to appeal to a new crowd either because it's, well, who would watch this? Oh wait, I did. Why did I do that? Number seven, Fat Four Stick. Now I know a lot of people probably thought this might be higher because, let's face it, there's never been a good Fantastic Four movie and this is probably the worst of the bunch, which is saying something considering the, you know, the first one they made by Roger Corman wasn't even meant to be released. Here's the thing. I'm not invested in the Fantastic Four franchise as in the comics. I know a little bit about it, but whatever. I'm prepared to deal with an adaptation that's not necessarily right there with the comic. And, you know, for the first, well, let's say, two-thirds of the movie, I kind of saw where it was going, or what I, where I thought it was going, and... True, it wasn't quite in keeping with the spirit of the comic, but whatever, it looked like it might be interesting. And then you can see where Fox actually took over production. You can see the fact that Kate Mara's hair no longer matches up. You can see that they just decided to try to take what was originally going to be a fairly dark superhero story and just make it a run-of-the-mill, cookie-cutter story about a bunch of superheroes that's still surprisingly gruesome because Dr. Doom just walks around blowing up people's heads with his mind for somehow and I don't understand how his powers work. <coughs> it's honestly the worst rendition of Doom I have ever seen and Doom is supposed to be one of the most interesting characters in the entire Marvel Universe and they completely botched him. I honestly do get why people hate this. I haven't even mentioned the horrible, horrible green screen that's particularly evident in the latter half of the film. Anybody who really hates this film, I get it, but I'm sorry, there's still six I hated more. Number six, Hot Pursuit. Now, Reese Witherspoon is an actress I admire. I saw her in Wild last year. She was great. Sofia Vergara I've had my problems with. I remember she was in Chef last year. Chef is a really good movie. She's actually quite enjoyable in that. She's in Modern Family. Not bad in that either. Here she talks like this the entire time, and then you have Reese Witherspoon, who has a southern accent for some reason, and the entire thing is jokes about Reese Witherspoon being short, Sofia Vergara being just a rich, stuck-up bitch. I'm sorry for that language, but whatever, it fits. I think I might have laughed three times in this entire film, but each time I laughed, Something happened immediately thereafter that is, you just ruined the joke. You just ruined it by continuing on for way too long. The most enjoyment I got out of this film was the outtakes in the end credits. When the outtakes are funnier than what's actually in the movie, you have a big problem. Mostly, this is just shrill and annoying, and I hated it. Number five, Jupiter Ascending. This is actually the first film of 2015 that I saw. Really set the bar high, didn't it? I'll say this. Some of the effect shots in here are quite good. The problem here is that the story makes my head hurt. The Wachowski seems to have had one good idea, and that was The Matrix. And even then, you take a look back at that film, it has major problems. This makes The Matrix look like the masterpiece that it's held up to be. All it is, is this girl, Mila Kunis, is apparently a genetic identical match to the matriarch of this family of three siblings. Don't think genetics works that way, but whatever. And then they proceed to have her captured and freed, captured and freed, captured and freed. Yeah, same story told three times. And bees are genetically programmed to detect royalty. One of the sons wants to marry her. Isn't that kind of like marrying your own mother? Ew! At one point, the captain of a ship tells her helm officer to change course, and you pan down to the helm officer, and it's this elephant-nosed guy who trumpets in response. What am I watching? Eddie Redmayne, what are you doing? 
First off, you're talking like this so we can barely hear you. Hey, suddenly you're screaming! I can't do it quite like he does, but then again, I wouldn't want to. This movie sucks. Number four, Pan. Now, here's a movie whose title lives up to its critical reputation, and that joke is just about as original as anything in this film. Okay, here's how the film opens. The boys are all in an orphanage, which is run by the most trunchbull like none you have ever seen, including the Trunchbull. So the nuns then raise a pirate flag, what, and then this pirate ship flies in, steals the boys from their beds, and then this is all taking place during Blitzkrieg London. So there's this pirate ship flying through London, being chased by World War II fighters who are wondering what they're shooting at. Oh, okay, whatever, it's fantasy, I can deal with this for a little bit. Then they're flying off to Neverland through space. Peter's attached to this rope and is playing with planets. It's the most obvious CGI doll I have ever seen. It looks like a cartoon. So then they fly to Neverland, they pull into this mine shaft where they're mining Pixium. Yes, dead fairies and their bodies make... Pixium, not pixie dust. And they all start singing Smells Like Teen Spirit. They never really explain why Peter can fly. You you know, in the original movie, it's because of the pixie dust. But the, no, no, no. What the pixie dust does is make Blackbeard, played by Hugh Jackman, younger. It's never explained that, you know, the pixie dust can allow you to fly. No, Peter just is punished. And they hear they, they sing Blitzkrieg Bop. And then he just starts flying. And that's when he find out that this entire thing is a chosen one narrative. How original. So he and Hook, and Hook has this really weird accent. It sounds almost like a little bit of Texan, but mixed with a little bit of pirate. But he's not either. Neverland itself, outside of the mine, looks like it was colored by some kid with just crayons. They meet up with the lost tribe of natives, and Rudy Mara is a native? What? The, then the natives are shot and they just explode into colored powder poofs? They meet up with Kara Divine. I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but she plays a pair of twin mermaids, and these things are the freakiest freaking things I have ever seen, and Hook's look at that. Oh, they're gorgeous. No, they're absolutely horrifying. Uh, they attack the pixie town with flamethrowers, which suddenly disappear just so that Peter can save the day. There, I told you the entire film. You don't need to go see it. I did. It's awful. Next movie. Number three, Fifty Shades of Grey. I honestly can't believe this is only number three. I wasn't going to go see this, but I decided that, you know, I need to go see this, just so that I can legitimately say if it's one of the worst food movies of the year, and yes, it is. Here's the thing. It's actually very well shot. Problem is, it's a well shot turd. The actors have no chemistry. The dialogue is the worst dialogue short of the number one film on this list that I have ever heard in a movie. The sex scenes, which are the selling point of this movie, are dull. This entire film can be described by that word, dull. I went into this thinking that I would hate this film, that I would loathe it with a passion. You know what I felt when I left this movie theater? Nothing. That might even be worse than feeling hatred towards it. I felt absolutely nothing. This film left me feeling completely empty. It's that bad. And yet somehow, not quite as bad as number two, Vacation. I, I don't even really want to talk about this movie. This movie is just a series of unrelated gags. Not even gags, events. And they are very loosely strung together simply by the fact that they happen to these same characters. This vacation will stand on its own. You don't need to be familiar with the other vacations to enjoy this vacation. That is almost verbatim a line from this fucking movie. They swim in shit. That's in the trailers. They swim in shit. And it's played for laughs. I'm not laughing. At one point, a cow is eating hamburgers. Oh, that's its favorite thing to eat. That's funny? Why? The father, Rusty, at one point tells his oldest son that a rim job is when... 
a man kisses a woman on the mouth, and then this son talks to a girl and says he wants to give her a rim job, and somehow those two are still together at the end of the movie. There is one tiny little scene that kind of got a little bit of respect for me, and that's because there's this shithead little brother who keeps bullying the older brother. And then the older brother finally decides to stand up for himself and is just kind of weakly slapping this little brother around saying, this is really awkward, stop that. Not funny, but it worked for what it was. The rest of this is just excruciatingly unfunny. But there's still one film that's worse. Number one. Unfriended. Fuck this movie. Fuck it with a hammer. This is the only film I have ever, ever even considered walking out of the theater for. I hated it that much. The entire film is just watching six obnoxious, freaking irredeemable teenagers screaming at each other over a Skype conversation. And even how, even when they how they film that doesn't make any sense because their hands are in the air at one point and somehow they're still typing. How the fuck does that happen? They switch windows and the volume on Skype drops. At one point, one character shares her screen so that everybody can see it and then starts typing something to her boyfriend who is also with on the call. How in the fuck is everybody else not seeing this? Oh... Apparently, not very little of this is scripted, or some of it was scripted, whatever. They're all sitting in their, these separate rooms in the same house, reading lines off a screen, and they still fuck it up. I'm doing this unscripted. I'm probably doing a better job than these fucking assholes did in this film. Ugh. I don't understand why this film actually got semi-decent reviews, because it is Fucking irredeemable! And the worst thing is, this movie is getting a fucking sequel sometime in 2016! <sighs> oh, fucking Hollywood. There it is! That's my list of the ten worst films of this year. Seriously, fuck Unfriended! Okay, gotta calm down. If you happen to like any of these, fine, whatever. Except Unfriended. I don't get anyone defending that film. That piece of shit garbage. <sighs> All right. Next time I'm, I'll be back with my list of my favorite movies of the year. And yes, there are some really good ones. I hope you look forward to that. I hope this was at least entertaining for you. It was kind of fun to make. I'll talk to you guys later.